All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jonathan with Audio Advice. Thank you for joining us on our monthly live stream giveaway. Today, we are really excited to have two of our close friends who represent Riga here in the United States. We have Bryce Allen and Steve Daniels. Thank you for joining us this evening, gentlemen. Today, we are really excited to have two of our close friends. And I'm getting a little bit of an echo. I don't know if that's on my end. Bryce Allen and Steve Daniels. Thank you for joining us this evening. All right, there we go. That's better. Maybe that's coming from Steve. We'll get we'll get that ironed out. So, anyways, thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, we're excited to be here today. We are giving away a Riga. We actually said we were going to be giving away a Riga Planar One. Our friends here actually said, you know what? We can do even better than that. We're going to be giving away a Riga Planar Two turntable, uh, which is awesome. So, thank you guys for for doing that upgrade for our friends here that are joining us today. And in addition to that, we're going to be giving away a Peach Tree M24 pair of powered bookshelf speakers which we absolutely love, and we're going to tell you guys all about that. We'll also be giving away an audio advice record care package with that that will be included as well. And again, our friends here are including a nice little Riga swag bag as well, uh, which we can tell you some more about here in just a minute. So thanks for joining in. Let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, we're excited to have everyone here tonight, and we will get rolling. So uh, Bryce, thanks for joining us. Just to kick things off a little bit, why don't you, we always have a fun question just to get everything rolling. Tell us, uh, what was the first first concert that you've been to that you remember when you were back in the day, uh, I guess? I went to a Radiohead concert back in Aberdeen, of all places. And it was one of these, um, oh, there's some tickets and you work in a hi-fi shop. You should really uh, go and see Radiohead. So I remember that was, was quite a night uh, and... Um, I think it went into the next day, if I recall. Yeah. That was one of those uh, nights that didn't stop until I went back to work at nine o'clock the next morning. That's a that's a pretty respectable first concert. So I have to yeah. Uh, Steve, same question. What was the uh, the first concert that you went to? Um, the the first first concert I went to, to was in London, and goes back concert. quite a few yeah. years, and it was a band uh, called. Steve. 10 cc yeah, the first concert that you went to and uh, uh, mind-blowingly good concert I, went to and was in we'll Steve. I think we're getting a little bit of echo there i don't know if you've got some some speakers or using something external maybe like a second tab maybe and uh, we'll check your tabs i'll make sure that's right we'll get that figured out so and then leon remind everyone what was the first i know you shared it with us in the past tell us the first first concert that you remember going to well i'm the old guy so uh i was 13 years old and went to see three dog night okay and, uh, that's a good one that was quite a long time ago but night. it was it was great i just remember it was way too loud for me because i'd never experienced something that loud and i had my hands up over my ears half the concert yeah we took our my son to see his first concert last year and i think for the first half an hour he just did that the whole time and then he then he got into it so that was pretty cool um i see people joining us from all over San Diego, San Antonio, obviously here in the Carolinas, Tampa. So let us know where you guys are were joining us from. Um, Bryce, tell us a little bit about the the Riga. Well, actually, just give us a little bit of backstory about the brand Riga. You know, for folks who are maybe new, don't know as much about Riga, or maybe they've heard of Riga, but they don't know the whole backstory in terms of the genesis uh, and where things all got started. Yeah, ultimately, um, it's a wonderfully um, it's a, a simple kind of story that ultimately Tony, or sorry, Tony Ralph and Roy Gandhi started a wonderful um, turntable company in 1973, if I'm not mistaken, um, that went uh, went around and, and you know, um, Roy was an originally uh, was a technical editor for Ford, if I'm not mistaken, so was was one of the people that understood the exploded diagrams involved in in, in the inside of cars and that kind of thing. Uh, but simplistic design, well executed, was was really the mantra for, for, for how they put things together, a very pragmatic way of looking at things. I don't know if uh, you've got anything to add, Leon, from your experience. You've, you've sold them probably for as long as they've been over in America. Quite a while, yes. Mm. They're great turn. And I think you're right. I think the uh, the simplicity, simple design that uses good concepts is is throughout the whole product line, both the turntables, amplifiers, everything. Uh, mm -hmm. And they sound fantastic. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Uh, Bryce, walk us through. So obviously Riga has a lot of different types of turntables. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, the Planar 1, the Planar 2, and the Planar 3 for those those folks who don't know as you sort of move up the line. The yeah. You yeah. You yeah. know, ultimately, they, they, they all look very similar, which is kind of hard to kind of differentiate. But ultimately, the best judge of these things is when you get the opportunity to listen to them. Uh, and you do a very good job uh, yourselves as a, as a business to kind of give an ex clean explanation between the two or between all of the models between between each other. The best descriptor I would give you is, is, is the sort of the one and the two are our sort of plug in and play options. Uh, then the threes and the sixes and the eights and the 10 are for the not saying the more discerning, but you get more every time you step. Uh, you know, the primary difference between a one and a two is the tone arm improves and the platter improves. So from phenolic resin to glass, uh, the dust cover on almost all of them is the same. That's one thing that people kind of often say, well, do they come with covers? I get that question probably at least once a month. Uh, and I say, no, no, they do come with covers. We don't really take photographs with them that well with covers, but uh, that's, that's the, the prime one two difference and then as you go two three it's more of the same it's you know a thicker glass platter a better precision tone arm uh, and ultimately the flexibility of adding um the neo power supply which is an external battery type thing to drive the motor for the turntable to make it sound even better uh, i know uh, you've done a leon many moons ago did a little comparison uh, video that we were all smiling at, saying, "Oh, that was a wee while ago." But refresh our refresh our own memories of what's involved. Um, yeah, so we've got. We'll, we actually just linked to it, and we'll link to it in the feed mm -hmm. here, um, where we do. A, I think do a really good job of walking you through each incremental step as you move up the line. Anything to add, Leon, on that? Yeah, when we did that comparison, I basically took them apart down to the took the bearing apart and all of that, looked at everything, mm -hmm. I weighed everything, and that's, it's a very detailed comparison. But Bryce, you nailed it. It's basically. Uh, Platters get heavier, more flywheel effect as you move up. Tone arms improve each jump. I think the the two you get the uh, double bracing on it starting there. Is that right? Or is it that threes the when you're bracing. Threes up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the threes are probably our best selling turntable. Uh, it's just such a great value for the money. And uh, yeah. and plus they just look so sleek and fantastic and are super simple to use and set up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a comment here just a minute ago. I'll, I'll see who it was from. I can't remember, but it said actually Michael Henry said um, your turntables look super high end and they're beautiful. So I think that's that's absolutely true. And to Leon's point, we sell a lot of turntables, you know, especially at that entry level price point. But the best selling turntable at Audio Advice, Leon, correct me if I'm wrong, is the Planar Three. You know, right around a thousand dollars. So that really speaks a lot to the you know the demand and the appreciation people feel for that that mm -hmm. type of price point, right? What uh, walk us through just a couple of questions I see here in, in re regards to um, cartridges. Tell us what's on the the one, two, and the different options for the yeah. three. So so the the one and the two come factory mounted with uh, Riga carbons, which are our sort of wee baby cartridge. It's a moving magnet. It is incredibly good in in terms of for what she's for what she is on the better ones you start the threes the sixes the eights and the tens we start to almost give you more variety of choice because we don't necessarily know what you're partnering it with so we we, we sometimes have a my 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 um phone is sometimes full of people saying well which one should i buy and the answer is it's a variety of factors nobody can tell you exactly what's the right one unless you really sit down and have a conversation, consultative kind of way to do things. But um, we go from the top seller probably for, for us in terms of, of, of Creature is the Planner 3 Elise 2, which is the moving magnet. It's a, a wee um, blue colored beastie uh, on the end of the tone arm. Um, visually, the cartridges are all made of the same kind of super hard plastic. Uh, and then we go into moving coil production, which was quite a, a lengthy process to do properly. And they've, they've, they've um, invested a lot of money 
to to kind of get themselves in a situation where we, we genuinely think we do some of the best moving coils the world has. Maybe not the biggest company from, you know, there's many fine cartridge manufacturers, but we do kind of acknowledge that we do an amazing table with an amazing talent and value. And then we'll mill the cartridge to match with the tone arm for its inherent challenges or weaknesses or strengths. Well, another thing that makes them, once you get to the, the least enough, really great is uh, the three-point mounting system. If you've ever mounted a phono cartridge, most have two screws and there's all this shifting and moving around to, do to get it perfectly aligned. But with the Riga cartridge is, you know, basically above the carbon, uh, you you can't get it out of alignment on the tone arm that's made to go on. It's mm -hmm. so simple to mount. Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's let's try to go back to Steve real quick and see if we can bring him in. If we got that delay uh, worked out, Steve, anything to add? Mm -hmm. So simple to mount. Yeah, looks like we're still getting the feedback. Yeah. So Steve, real quick, try to maybe just um, close everything you have except for just this particular window and we'll see if that works. And if not, we'll we'll figure it out here as we go. Uh, Leon, tell us a little bit about, in addition to the peach, I'm sorry, to the uh, Riga Planar 2 turntable, we're giving away the Peachtree M24. So tell us a little bit about, uh, I guess, Peachtree and the, and the M24 bookshelf speaker. Yeah, Peachtree is a company that uh, we partner with, and they make uh, a powered speaker. So everything's in the speaker you need. It's got uh, amplifiers for the two drivers in it, and uh, it's got a phono input, which means you can just plug the turntable right in, but they're beautifully made, and uh, those speakers just sound so good for the money. Uh, they, they have a full, rich sound. They're beautifully made, uh, plenty of inputs, you know, USB for your computer, Phono input, uh, just I, I think they're just such a great value, and they they've been around for a while, but we can't tell them anything to do to improve them. Actually, when they ask us, they they just sound so amazing for the for the price point. Um, yeah, absolutely. they do sound best I think on a stand, elevated up just a little bit or angled if you're going to use them on your desk. But uh, they do really well on a bookshelf with a turntable sitting there, you know, as a, as a music system as opposed to a computer desktop speaker. Either way works great. Um, it has a great remote as well, right? This is a great, great use yes. case. Um, yeah. It's easy to turn, you know, change from the various inputs, you know, Bluetooth, uh, phono, etc. Uh, just right from the right from the remote control, which is really cool. And we'll, we'll link to it as well. We've got a great written review and video review that goes through all the different differences between the M24 and its bigger brother, the M25. And those are avail available in both uh, black and bamboo. So, you know, really, really popular powered speaker that we sell, especially as home folks are at home, you know, working from home, uh, great use case, uh, both for music, you know, and for computer audio and, and so forth. So definitely check those out. Going to be a great package, actually a little over a thousand dollar package that we were really excited about. And we'll be announcing that here right at the end, uh, end of the hour. Uh, go ahead and start asking us questions. We're going to get to as many of those as possible. Uh, we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. We'll also come back and maybe leave some answers afterwards. If you're watching this on Facebook, on YouTube, you know, go ahead and leave those comments. We can see those coming in all through both of those two channels. Um, and so we'll get rolling here with uh, with a couple of different questions if you guys see here. So uh, I guess Mauricio, hopefully I said it right, is asked uh, the Planar 3, why do you think the at least two cartridges gets mixed reviews, especially among audiophiles? That's a, that's a good question to get hey, rolling with here. And I guess honestly, what other yeah. cartridges do you recommend for the Planar 3? Yeah, I mean, I suppose the answer is I'm the guy that works for Riga. So in some respects, uh, <laughs> the, the people will say, oh, he's bound to say that. There's a million different cartridges out there. Ultimately, we, we build it with the acknowledgement. We know what's strong about the turntable and what's weak about the turntable, which is, you know, looking at it kind of holistically. Do I think... Um, there's better cartridges, of course. There's better cartridges than an Elise Exact, for instance. If anyone's had the luxury of having a three day one, and then they put an Exact on a P3, they'd never buy an Elise again. That's the truth in the matter. Uh, and from the mechanic stance, there's an awful lot of commonality there. But it's just the way the the fine line stylus on the better cartridge sounds gives you better results. So, you know, I'm not here to poke holes in anyone else in some respects. You guys have 
lots of experience and Leon's probably ha listened to thousands of cartridges over the years uh, and some of them just work better with some things. The, the, the honest answer is, you know, are you building a hi-fi for a hi-fi sake or a hot rod or a certain album to sound brilliant? There's an awful lot of people that maybe are going, looking at it the wrong way ultimately and say, oh, I need to buy this because it sounds best with my T-Rex uh, Electric Warrior. And, and then everything else in their collection might be kind of somewhat detrimental. You know, I think you might you want to add to that, Leon, from a philosophical kind of question rather than anything else. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the, the whole interaction of the tone arm and the mass of the cartridges and the compliance that the, the cam lever has to gel together. And that's why I like sticking when you can with a, uh, a Riga cartridge on a Riga arm. But there's no question, the exact does sound better. Um, but I, I think, you know, especially when you get the package deal with the three and the Elise, it's, it's, it certainly sounds great. And that is our best-selling combination. We get tons of great comments on it. Uh, are there better cartridges? Certainly. Uh, you do have to do a little modifying uh, of the tone arm in a lot of cases if you're going to change it out to a different brand. And we've got some spacers we do that with, but it's not as plug and play as with a Riga cartridge. But it's a it, cartridges are almost like speakers. They uh, they they do sound different, and uh, even how you load them and amplify them has a big impact on it. You got to get that right too. Uh, Raymond asks, are the motors in, are, are, the, are the motors all the same in the various Riga models? Uh, they are the, they're tighter tolerant on the, on the better ones. So in some respects we use a, a very good precision motor company. In fact, we use about three, but they're all of the same tolerance, but they're all of the same heart of the thing, but the tolerances involved in them are, are, are considerably better as you move up the range. So in some respects, they might look alike, but a three motor to a six motor, you 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 would be surprised that, you know, the, the fundamentals are similar, but the precision of the six is that much better. Yes, yeah. and you've got more, better support circuitry as you move up in the tables too, mm -hmm. which makes a difference as well. You know, with the three, you can add the TTPSU to give it an external power supply for the motor, yeah. which vastly improves it. And yeah. we, we have a lot of people that are saying, the, uh, I think one thing that'd be helpful, we're getting a lot of, a lot of, uh, I don't want, I don't want to use the word basic questions, but let, maybe we can help kind of demystify a little bit for folks who are new to vinyl. So I think they maybe get a little intimidated by a turntable. Um, how do I calibrate it? You know, all the different components that go into a turntable. Do I need a phone stage? All those kind of things. So maybe just, you know, real simple. What are the essential elements of, um, Hearing music through a turntable. Okay. I like to take that one. So oh, it's, sure. first, it's it's a ton of fun because you actually have to listen to the whole side of the record and you can't hit skip. I mean, that that's the the best part. And there's holding the the the, the content in your hands, looking at the album art, cleaning it off. It, it's almost like if you've ever made high end tea. There's a whole process to that. It's you know playing a record similar to that, uh, but you basically, you know, especially with the, the Riga 1 or 2, uh, setup is super simple. Um, you just get the counterweight on and you're pretty much good to go. Set, and it needs to plug into a photo preamp. So that's why a lot of people might not understand at first. Your receiver or amplifier, if it's got something labeled photo on it, you're good to go. Because uh, most of those are moving magnet photo inputs, which is what's going to be on the 1 or the 2 and a three for the most part. Um, if not, you can buy an external photo preamp and Riga makes a bunch of those. We have all kinds of different brands and that goes in between those two. And you, if you do that, you'd never want to plug a photo preamp into a photo input. It always has to go into an auxiliary input. And then you want to make sure it's on a level shelf and it's best if your speakers are not like right next to it because the photo cartridge picks up vibrations in the record, the little movements and the grooves. And you don't want the air motion from the speakers if they're right there or shaking the shelf to get into that. But I mean, you can have them a few feet apart unless they go really deep in the base. I say, you know, the worst thing you do is put a turntable on top of a subwoofer. That would not be good. But, uh, <laughs> other than that, it's, it's just, I, I think the fact that it, it forces you to sit and listen to a whole side of a record 
hearing the songs the way the artist intended them in the order they intended them to be heard too. There's something to that too. So, uh, yes. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's, and I think, uh, uh, I think, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I, was yeah, just, I, was, I think I we're, think we're right. We're, right, we're trying right, to, right, right, to right, 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 it's going on. So, so, uh, uh, one of the things I think that is helpful for people to know, if they bought their first turntable, they plug it into a pair of speakers and they hear just like the faintest of noise, right? What's the, the easiest troubleshooting for that, that scenario? They don't have a phono stage or their speakers have a little switch in the back that switches between auxiliary and phono because that's how most powered speakers are. Make right. sure it's in the phono position. But that, Jonathan, you nailed it. That's a, if you don't hear much sound, you're not going into a phono stage. That's right. First, first sort of you know question that we get oftentimes for folks that are new to vinyl, and it's you know don't be intimidated, right? These are these are questions that we get all the time. So you know if you're running into that situation, you know no problem. Let us know. Uh, easy, easy troubleshoot fix like Leon just mentioned, or we can recommend you know an, an easy phono stage that'll help you sort of as that in between to help uh, convert that signal over. And then one of the things that's really great about the Peachtree series is it has the phono stage already built into the powered speaker, right? So yeah. that way you don't have to have that and use the phono stage within the within the speaker. Uh, that way you just plug the turntable up and, and you're ready to go, right? Exactly. So it's super straightforward, really easy. Yeah. Um, Leon, some people but, are asking uh, a couple of the, the other other part that's fun about vinyl, just if you're thinking about it, is the the hunt for the records. You know, record mm -hmm. stores are more prevalent now. They're on you know quite easy to find in most bigger cities. And it's just fun to browse through records. There's just something neat about that I love. Yeah, this, um, let's see here. Oh, we're back to Mauricio. He said, uh, which is very, very true, where, you know, as Leon mentioned, one of the things my wife and I love to do is put a, put a record on and listen to it from start to finish. It just really creates that whole experience, right? And it's really sort of how the, art, how the artist maybe, um, you know, put the whole album together, right? You know, sort of how they That's put right. it together. And it's a great experience to do so that way, as opposed to sort of playing, you know, jukebox, you know, song to song to song across all different artists. So that, that's one of the things that's just great about the overall experience. So yeah, great point there, uh, Mauricio. Bryce, were you able to help our friend Steve? Yes, out, I think Steve might be in action. So I'm, try. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna bring him back in. Steve, we'll, we'll give it a shot here. Hopefully, we made it work out. And if not, um, no worries. We'll keep rolling. So poor, poor, Steve, poor Steve. Steve. yeah, you are fine. We made it work. I think we're good. Go, so good job, Bryce. Way to do some real time yes. troubleshooting. Audio, uh, audio correction audio. tabs. Yeah, so we've we've fixed it now. But Excellent. yeah, I think I, I would concur with you that that you know record playing is a different experience. Honestly, you know, there, there a lot of people will give the well, oh, which one's better when I'm at a show? Which one's better? The yeah. answer is they're really different. I, I honestly think you'll 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 like them for different things. Yep. And what just sort of the, the you know the always the the battle between digital and, and analog? Tell us maybe what people could expect to hear in terms of difference uh, between those two different formats. What are your thoughts on that? Well, why Steve has said very little, so I'm going to throw him to the line. <laughs> What's the difference? I think it's um, listening to analog is a much more immersive experience than digital. Um, and the whole concept of playing a record, if you go back, you listen to a performance in its entirety and often the album told a story. So I think it is a very different, um, a different format. I know a lot of the, the, the bands are coming out now and saying, look, if you want to hear our music as we intended it to, to be heard, buy it on vinyl. So I don't think it's, you know, it's, um, it's just such a difference in, in listening. And digital is great. It, it can be done really well. But there's just something about analog um, that is very, very compelling. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Mike said, why is someone could basically figure out how to flip the record without a human having to do it? The reason I put that up there is something that folks may not know is there are some great tone arm lifters uh, that we carry just as accessories. Leon, you maybe want to just share a little bit about those? Yeah, we have some. So, you, you know, you don't have to worry about the uh, stylus sitting there at the end of the record group kind of hidden against the edge. It can lift itself up. But yeah, if someone can invent that, you could add to any turntable, <laughs> pick up the arm and move it over for you and uh, flip the record without hurting it. That would, that would be quite the yeah. prize. It's just isn't, that, that what, isn't that what children are for? Yeah. 
Well, yeah. I find that after a sign of a record, it's, it's about time for you know, another yeah. glass of wine or so. Yeah, it's time to right. uh, I think this is from Raymond as well. Uh, what improvements in sound do you get? Maybe as you move up, let's talk about uh, some of the other turntables from the three and then to the six and then to the eight. As, as you move up through those, tell us, I guess, just a little bit of difference in those tables. And then if you were uh, just from a listening perspective, what are the things that you could expect to try to uh, listen for as you move up that line? Um, I'll let you go ahead, start. Do you want me to have a go at that one? Yeah, you can yeah, have a go. go I'll, I'll, I'll. So um, Riga came out with a book called A Vibration uh, Measuring Device, which is how they look at a record player. So as you go up the Riga line, what you're basically getting is more precise engineering applied to reading the disc. And if you think about it, playing a record is about retrieving information. You've got um, information there in the order of a millionth of an inch. And as you go up from, say, a one to a two, a two to a three, you get more precision applied. You'll get more information off of the record. So it's not necessarily a quantitative thing, You're more bass, more treble, because you don't know how much bass or treble is on the album. But what you will experience is hearing more of the musicians, uh, the ability to follow what they're doing, a sense of engagement with the music. So it's, it's very hard to quantify, but you, by a simple demonstration, you're here, you know, uh, you'll put a record on, say, a plane of one, and then to a two, and it's just a better experience. Um, same to a two, to a three. Um, it's yeah. almost like going to a, a, a jazz club and you see maybe a seven o'clock and a nine o'clock performance. And, you know, in one of those performances, you're going to say, yep, the band was together, they were playing, they were tight. Those are the kind of differences you experience as you go up the range. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, and I think you also, the, the music seems to come from a quieter, blacker background as the turntables get more precise, too. Because there's there's less chance of any bearing noise, better isolation. I, I just noticed that that um, as you move up in the line, it's like you reduce surface noise, even though it doesn't seem like it. It's almost that you do. That's what I experience. Yeah, yeah. And you're looking at different components. Um, you know, the precision and and the methodology of, of an, say an arm on a planar ten is almost the whole cost of a a planar <laughs> three, for example. So. Um, it's all about precision, getting more information off, and resolution. And that equates to a much, much more enjoyable experience listening to the music. Yeah, I put Reed's question up, uh, difference in tone arm between the one, two, and the three. And again, we, we have a full review where we walk through each one of those. But as Steve just mentioned, the, you know, the tone arm on the 10 is you know, the, the cost of the maybe the, the two or the one in terms of a table. So maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about that, because we haven't spoken much about your higher end tables. I think it was just this time last year, you guys came, uh, Riga released the new Planar 10. So walk us through uh, a little bit about the Planar 8 and the Planar 10. Well, both both those uh, turntables came from uh, a project called the Naiad. And that was basically a no holds barred um, development by Riga on making the very best record player they could irrespective of price. And it was like a, a research uh, tool. And a lot of the uh, concepts from that came down into the eight and the 10. And so you see a, a skeletal frame. Uh, Riga is very the antithesis of most record player manufacturers. Most people go for high mass. Riga go for low mass designs. The more you can strip away, the better. It's like a Formula One car. Um, so in the eight and the ten, you have a skeletal frame. Uh, the arm is uh, developments of what went before, but much more precise. Uh, the motor technology again improved over uh, the plane of uh, the P8. Um, so. A lot of that came from a very advanced concepts and the, the foam material was something that hadn't been used in record players before. Uh, the platter on the 10 um, 
is a different, very different material, a hardened material. So you're seeing engineering, which is stripping away things, lower mass, um, to give a more precise sound. Yeah, Bryce, anything to add or uh, Leon? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the it's it, Steve did a very good job of summarizing. It's it's just more of the the same, you know. Even strange things like the 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 to to lighten the mass of the tone arm on a ten, it's polished to make it lighter and stronger, not necessarily to make it prettier. You know, we 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 I think it's 0.7 of a gram is the actual weight difference between a painted arm. And a, and a polished arm. Understandably, the polished arm takes a bit longer to do, but if it makes it a, a better tone arm, then why wouldn't you do it? And, and that's the, the very truth in the way that they approach the design premise. And you, you see, if you take a planar one and you go up through a, an eight or a 10, you see a, a commonality of engineering purpose. So it's not radical shifts in thinking, you know, one's a high mass, um, you'll see a very similar tone arm shape because it works. But as you go up through the range, you can get refinements, enhancements in precision engineering, bearing tolerance, um, the bearings on a, a 10 or an eight, are the highest that we can possibly do at this time. So you're just looking at enhanced precision to get more information out of that groove which translates to a, a much better musical experience. There's nothing on any of the Riga tables which is superfluous. It's designed for an engineering purpose. Your form really does follow function. They look very simple, um, but that's kind of the, the engineering behind them. Yeah. And we just linked to the, our, our review on the, the Planar 8 and the Planar 10, which is, which is I think, very, very thorough. And, and, you know, to your point, when you see the Planar 10, it's, um, it's sort of elegance is the fact that it looks so simplistic. But obviously, it's, you know, it sounds amazing. I mean, it's one of the best turntables I think I've ever, ever heard firsthand. And, yeah, it blew me away when I took it home. And it's like a work of art, too. You know, it's, uh, it's quite a great table. Cool. Um, Leon, someone, I can't remember, I'll try to find it, posted a question about the importance of the needle. So that's obviously something we could probably talk a little bit, a little bit about. And I guess, you know, something that we see all the time, folks, you know, if they're not really careful when they're just maybe setting the, uh, the cartridge up for the first time, it, it's, it can be really easy, uh, unfortunately, to, to damage that needle. So maybe just some basic care tips for those. Um, and then maybe you can talk a little bit about the, you know, the importance of, of the type of needle that you're using or, or just in, in when you're looking for in a cartridge. Well, it's, yeah, it, it is the part, yes, the, the, the needle is the stylus that's mounted on the cantilever that comes out of the cartridge body. And that's what's moving and picking up the vibrations of the record groove. And when you first get one, you just got to be careful when you take the cover off to just be careful. You, most of the covers either pull straight out or pull straight down. Just do that. Save it. Yeah. And uh, when you're cleaning it, you always want to go from back to front. You don't want to go from front to back. You want to make sure to go back to front. But, but I will say, you know, against the grain, the most, yeah, I think one of the most important things is to keep your records and stylus clean. Uh, we, we get some people who say, my, you know, I've had this for two months and it just sounds terrible now. And uh, it turns out there's just a, there's stuff you can't see on the stylus because your records are dirty and picked it up as it's playing it. So you, you need a, a good stiff brush and usually some liquid to get it clean, but it's, it's super critical to keep it clean. Then there's different types of stylus shapes, like on the carbon, that's a conical stylus. As you move up, you go to elliptical and then fine contact and you keep moving on up to where it, it mimics more of the shape of the record groove itself. And that just pulls more information out of the record. It does take a more precise tone arm for those to track and get everything out. So that's why you see the higher end shapes put on the higher end tone arms. Uh, yep. Just and we just posted uh, we just posted to our turntable buyers guide. So again, if you're trying to sort of demystify, um, you know what all is in included, what all is required, you know, to listen to vinyl. Obviously. It may sound intimidating at first, but I think once you unpack it, you realize it's actually not as complicated as maybe you might think going into it. So for those of you who are new to vinyl or want to learn more about vinyl, definitely check that out. I mean, we walk you through everything that we just sort of talking about in terms of the different um, 
elements or parts that make up a turntable, you know, what you need, and then obviously some some record care and turntable care uh, best practices as well. And I think we've got another one on how to clean your stylus that we're going to post here in just a minute. So for those of you asking questions, maybe a little bit more about what Leon was referring to, we'll post that as well so you can dive a little deeper in terms of um, how to care for that. So sw switching gears a, a little bit, folks have asked, you know, in this, you know, specifically with some of the, the Riga products that are available, what are what are some of the go-to um, either integrated or phono stages for you know the various turntables? Maybe we'll start at sort of the entry level tables and, and work our way up the line in terms of what you guys recommend, um, you know, for someone looking for for a, a phono stage or, or maybe an integrated. Bryce, Steve, we'll, we'll we'll start with you guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, fundamentally, we we do a, a selection of phono stages for the level that we think is most apt for for the tables. So we do the phono mini for the smaller range of tables, the ones and the twos, and then the threes and the sixes and the eights, we're, we're saying you probably want a phono MM or a phono MC, depending on the cartridge choice. So for, those of us we, who, for those of who are listening who don't know what MM and MC stand for, tell us what are the differences between the two. So moving magnet is one method of, of, of design and moving coils the other so it's, it's it's a different you know one's about 100 times quieter than the other so you need different levels of gain to get them up to the level that your amplifier or your your active speakers would understand so that's why we we, we kind of um it, it's not as simple as our oh this will work process you, you really need to talk to specialists or advisors to to make sure you you get the right partnership for what you buy because you wouldn't put remodes on the Ferrari, so to speak, uh, which is, is something that, you know, in my, all my years of doing it, sometimes people have come to me with, the, they've got something wonderful and then they let it down with not buying the, the, the right ancillary component to make it work the best. And I, I, would, I would argue that um, the turntables are exactly the same. There's a bit more hocus pocus and seeming wizardry in there, but fundamentally it, it's got to be matched to, to its brother or its sister to make it work its best. And, and, and we, we do a selection of phono stages from about a couple of hundred dollars through to $6,000. So right. we, we, we have a huge gamut of choice and, and, and you've got to judge it for how good it is with the device in hand. We wouldn't uh, rush out everyone to the top one because that would be foolish. And I guess tell us about the uh, the Brio, and then I think you have near you the uh, the IO as well. Yeah, so I, 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 I have a I have a handy prop. This is the brand new IO integrated amplifier, which is five hundred and ninety five dollars, uh, and is astonishing. It's 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 kind of I know it sounds pretty cheeky to sort of say to for someone who's wanting their first proper audio components, you maybe get a Riga turntable. A lovely IO amplifier, so the first inputs, a moving magnet phono stage, and a set of speakers. And the world of choice of speakers is is a is a conversation that would take far too long for everyone. So I won't mention it. But uh, you you you'll find the perfect partner. And 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 we're building a set of lovely speakers. I wonder if Steve wants to touch on that. But um, you you you'll find that that we we're. I suppose I, I hark back to when I started and I said, audio seemed more affordable then. And I, I think that was their aim here, was to make a something that was attainable for quite a lot more of the populace to get really into audio without all the audio file kind of baggage. And that's, I think, a, a unique thing with Riga is they do make all aspects of the, the replay chain record players, phono stages, amplifiers, speakers. So they see it very much as you can use any of the components with anyone's gear. But the idea is that they also build systems. So certainly, uh, you know, a, a planar one or two with an IO and a pair of good speakers makes a, a bigger than the a greater than the whole difference. I mean, they really do work incredibly well together. Um, some of the integrators also have phono stages built into them as well. Mm -hmm. so the IO, the Brio, the Elex, all come with so that, phono stages. Yeah, well, we yeah, first got, we're uh, gonna, uh, we got a, one of my uh, people who works in the store 
it was a Saturday and I got this phone call. I was like, Leon, you would not believe how good this thing sounds. It is just amazing. You know, that you guys really knocked it out of the park with that little integrated amp. There's something magical about it on the right pair of speakers. Yeah. The uh, designer, the guy, Terry Bateman, Sorry. Um, he's um, just a genius in terms of circuit designs and knowledge of circuitry. And a lot of it goes back to some older designs that were in his head. Um, but the components were not available at that time to make some of these products. So uh, a lot of these are, I wouldn't say retro designs, but um, they harken back to that kind of magic, you know, those magical designs of years ago. Uh, just very involving. And folks are asking just price points on those two. The IO is uh, just under six hundred dollars, and the yep. Brio is yep. right at a thousand, nine ninety five, and yeah. So we got a full uh, article on the Brio that you guys that we just posted. So you guys, if you have more questions or want to learn more about that. It's a it's a great setup in terms of you know working with a turntable and powering a pair of speakers. Um, let's see. If you got yeah, questions, we're gonna, review, we're gonna have a review comparing the IO to the Brio to the the Elexr soon. I'm going to the store uh, Saturday to grab them, Jonathan, bring them all home, and do some serious listening to them. Awesome. That's a, that'll be fun, I'm sure. Um, can you send some fish and chips over <laughs> if I order a turntable? Not oh, sure class. Uh, backing up just a little bit, some folks are just asking you, we were talking earlier about vinyl vinyl in the experience. What what uh, jumps out in terms of you know your favorite record to demo a turntable or to demo a pair of speakers? What's your what's your go to? Uh, Leon, we'll start with you. Oh man, yeah, you know, there's just so many. Uh, just any, you know, I'm a Rolling Stones fan, so you know that their recordings may not be the best sounding, but they really get me involved in the music. Uh, you know, for 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 really great big sound, you know, a lot of the Crosby, Stills, Nash stuff, or Crosby Nash, uh, to me fills up the room. Uh, there's there's just so much, but um, I have to admit, I'll put on Dead Flowers, or you can't always get what you want. Usually, when I'm first testing out a system, just to uh, give it a spin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bryce. Uh huh. What do I listen to? to um, I have lots of crazy electronic stuff, and also I just bought the Killers box set, so that will be coming any day now, which is quite something. But I, I kind of, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll jump tracks for a moment and say, whenever you're buying any of these turntables, I want you to bring three records to your specialist. One you love and know very well, like Leon had just mentioned. One that you don't know very well and you're almost confused why you own. And one you dislike, so maybe a partner's album or one that you've never really enjoyed. And the one thing that you'll notice is on the ones that you don't like as much, you'll hear a quantitative difference between the two turntables or the three turntables that you're listening to. It's a really strange phenomenon. And I'm surprised that audio stores don't tell people, bring the stuff that you don't like and you'll be much more matter of fact about, is this truly better or am I hearing things? Because we get kind of used to our comfortable shoes and that's the only shoes we want to choose. And I, I think that's something that's really kind of compelling. I do it at shows. I ask people to bring some records or, pull some records from my own collection, some that I hate, but I own, and I play them at shows. And people ask me, why are you playing that? And I'm like, I don't know, I don't really like it, but it shows the difference well. Steve? Great um, advice, Bryce, by the way. Steve? I, t I tend to use, if I was doing a, a demonstration, I tend to use something fairly simple um, that you can hear and um, follow along with. Um, it was quite interesting. I used to do a lot of um, musical evenings and we would go up and we'd play three or four turntables and you would uh, say to the audience, you know, um, what differences did you hear? And you'd get hands going up in the air and people would tell you there's more bass, there's more treble, whatever it was. And you'd ask the, the group, what was the song about? And no one typically could tell you. Usually it was the ladies in the room who were not listening to hi-fi, but listening to the music, 
who could hear the real musical differences. But you get some, you know, audiophiles and they would go on so eloquently. Uh, you know, was it a happy or sad song? No idea. Give me a few words from the song. No idea. So I think if, if you're, you know, using music to, to do demonstrations, I think listening to the music, be it whatever, rather than the hi-fi tells you a lot more than how much bass or treble. So it shows, I tend to use a lot of folk music, um, but, you know, I grew up in London and worked in a hi-fi shop there. And we did, we did the same thing as Bryce up in Scotland, which was uh, have customers come in. Yes, bring in your dire straits, and I'll hear it for the thousandth time that week. But bring in stuff that you don't like, or maybe a new genre of, you know, have you ever listened to opera music? No, I hate it. Um, so I'd stick on some opera music, you know, and the guy might still not like it, but he, he appreciates on different equipment the, the uh, improvements that you would get in the music. So, yeah, that's a good point. Maybe you get a little bit of blindness or numbness to a track that you hear, you know, over and over and over. It's great to have a reference track, right? So you know what to really try to listen for and identify. But maybe there's also times as you can get a little sort of numb, if you will, to, uh, you know, all the different maybe intricacies yeah. of a track. Uh, so it makes it good to hear something new. Uh, I guess real quick, Joseph asked, can we come to the store and take a listen to any of these rigas? Leon, tell us, we, we got, we have all kind of your turntables. Yes, and we have so, tons. We have probably every table that we've talked about out on demo, plus the Brio. I don't know if we have the I.O., but I'm sure we will put one out. Um, we have the I.O. out. Yeah, the I.O.'s out. Uh, so we yeah, two. we have lots of them. And Raleigh and Charlotte, they're all there for demo. Um, and it's fun. Just uh, come on in. We're open. Uh, the Raleigh store is 10 to 8, Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 6 Saturday. I think Charlotte store is 10 to 6, uh, Tuesday through Saturday. So, yeah, open there. Yeah, obviously during COVID yeah, year. Yeah, and we're, we're being super safe. We like to wear a mask. We clean it, everything off. Uh, but, and of course, uh, you know, you can call our experts and just talk to us. We can talk you through a lot of the differences if you're not able to come in and do a demo. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that's great about the stores, uh, you know, obviously if you're in the Carolinas, you're, you're passing through on the way to the mountains or the beach is, um, you know, we have world-class showrooms, you know, again, in Raleigh and Charlotte, and you can listen to all the different turntables that we've mentioned. You know, you can listen to a $10,000 turntable, and you can also listen to some of the best gear, whether it's, you know, you name the, the, the high-end luxury uh, speaker brand, you know, we carry them. So if you want to hear, you know, the, the best experience that you can probably get anywhere, uh, you know, definitely come to one of our showrooms. And again, even during our current environment, we're, we're taking every precaution we can to make sure people have a, a great experience, but a safe experience as well. Um, so thanks for that question, Joseph. A couple other ones, I guess some people asking, maybe get a little bit more technical, uh, you know, how do you reduce interference with vinyl? I know that's something that people run into from time to time. Any sort of best practices or, or tips and tricks for that? You mean things like record noise? And yeah, yeah. More, and any more, kind of acoustic, more, acoustic interference. Feedback, more acoustic feedback maybe, or? Yeah, I think that's what they're uh, referring to. That was from John Wendell. Yeah. I mean, proximity is is the a lot of the challenge with record players because they are a vibration measuring tool. So if you've got the, using Leon's earlier example, if it's on a subwoofer, it's going to be a nightmare because the energy from the subwoofer conveys through the turntable and, and echoes through. The other thing that's quite important is that they're not really close to things with massive toroidal transformers because they throw off a big loom of EMI that you never see but you can hear and and then you know the, the, the obvious test is actually when I've done it myself in environments is you physically lift the turntable and rise it maybe 12 inches and the noise goes away because now we're out of the EMI field that was generated by the enormous power amp maybe the, sh the shelf or two shelves below. And um, that's one little thing, you know, the obvious comment is that, you know, we, we, there's, a, there's always a level of noise with the record player. It's just almost listening through it in a way. Better ones yes. allow that easier is the reality. Yeah, don't um, take your turntable air connects and wire tie them to the power cord. You know, <laughs> yeah, that, that will that's cause that. interference for sure. And the better the record player, the less you hear things like pops and clicks. Yes. And so it's um, it's also a function of 
uh, again, that precision coming into play. But, uh, you know, you go up through the range and, and they become less and less noticeable, I think. Yeah. I saw someone mention sure. static. You get a static gun. You can, I don't know if they still make them. It's called a zero stat. Do they still they do? We have it. Oh, Mil so Milty you've got Milty no, makes it. Yeah, 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 okay. They, they, they exist. Um, and just good care practices for getting anti static sleeves, cleaning the records properly, keeping them all safe as much as you can do. And, and, and that's all that I do for static because it happens to the best of us. Uh, quick question. Uh, so folks asked a little bit if they want to purchase a, a turntable mm -hmm. from Vika. Uh, one is which one should I should I start with? Should I start with a planar one or should I jump up to a planar two? Maybe if I have a budget of you know five six hundred bucks. And then if you guys could touch on, I think maybe some folks um, you know don't realize your relationship with Riga. And if you have a Riga turntable, you don't have to ship it all the way back to the UK, right? So maybe you guys can share a little bit about uh, yeah. your role in that process. Yeah, I've been the Riga distributor since 2003, and I've known them since uh, the late 70s when I was in the UK. So uh, nothing in the record players never need to go back to the UK. Uh, we can fix anything here in the US. And typically, uh, the retailers that we have can, can do that. They're very yeah, like you, said, you guys are great at sending parts, but it's super super rare that we have any issues, really. Yeah, they're, right. they're extremely reliable. Yeah, we sell hundreds of Rigas per month, and we might get one or two, right? And mm -hmm. it's usually something that's just a uh, an easy fix, right? So it's yeah. not like we're having to ship lots of lots of parts. Do you got there? You know, Bryce and Steve are actually based in Texas, even though they have the the great British accents. Um, so they're here in the U.S., so it's not like we're having to ship stuff, you know, across the pond or anything like that, which is great. Uh, real quick question. Someone says, since we have a couple of folks from, from uh, the U.K., what is the difference between British and American sound? Uh, that, is a, that is a good question. It's all right. You do it wrong. It's fine. It's wonderful. We'll carry on. No, I, from, from my experience, I would say that the american sound if i had to give it one you you are a bit more keen on the bass than we are in britain uh, a little bit not in a detrimental way but a little bit more and that's not to say it's bad it's just quite different um would you agree steve from your experience i think one of the one of the big differences is you know the uk is kind of a, a hotbed for 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 years and years for independent audio manufacturers. And I think there, there was quite or is quite a difference because most of those companies, the focus is on music, less specifications or um, the hi-fi sound. And I think when I came to the States, you know, there would be these huge, mega expensive hi-fis that you know the blow the wars off but they didn't actually play music very well and i think you could have take you know you can take some of the maybe the uk stuff and it wouldn't be as big and as loud it'd be far more enjoyable to listen to records on and more compelling that you want to do it and any hi-fi system i think is only it only makes sense for you if it makes you want to play music and continue to use it um you know and play record after record and it's an enjoyable thing so i think there is a difference um, i'm not sure it's the same now but i think a, you've got manufacturers who are making hi-fi and maybe more emphasis on the specs and then others that are looking at it um you know here's a piece of software how do we get the most information off that um, and make it sound as good as possible so I don't know if that answers the question, but um, it's well, I think a lot sure. of UK companies and, and some American companies do it, but more UK companies for sure. They design the circuit and then they listen to different components that have the same value from a spec point to see which sound the best. And I think the most neutral sound winds up going in, just from my perspective. Uh, most British hi fi gear has a very neutral involving really good rhythm and pacing quality to it. 
that I've heard over time. Uh, one or two quick questions. Uh, if you had to upgrade either the turntable or the cartridge, which route would you take? Turntable. Why? Because the cartridge can only be as good as the arm and the arm only as good as the turntable. So you could actually take a lesser cartridge on a better turntable and it would sound better than a very expensive cartridge um, on a not so good turntable. The turntable will be the limiter. The stylus isn't playing the record, the re record is driving the stylus. So the more accurately you can turn that and with greater precision, the more information you pick up. So I would advocate that uh, say a planar six with an Elise is going to be better than a planar one or two with an Apillion cartridge. You'll no get questions. You I totally, totally agree. You, you've got to support the cartridge properly, spin the disc properly to pick up the sound off the disc. And it is amazing what happens when you put a, a low end cartridge on a high end tone. It's like, well, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, people are surprised because that's contra to some people's yeah. viewpoints and that's something with the riga cartridges we were talking about earlier they're also designed with a mechanical aspect to them with the three-point mounting to avoid movement not just from side to side but back to front hardened bodies so they can be talked correctly uh, because the only thing you want to move is the record groove in relation to the stylus if you have any movement anywhere else in the system, and we're dealing with information in the order of a millionth of an inch, you'll start losing music information. So very much the record player, the arm, then the cartridge, in, a, in our viewpoint. Yeah, I think and, everybody- and, and, and the millionth of the inch thing, uh, just to give you a, a, a kind of a, a scale thing. Someone explained it to me once, is when you pull a record out of a sleeve and you see a rainbow, the coloring, the, the sort of the, the look there, the, the thickness of a millionth of an inch is roughly oil on water. So that's the same mirroring you're seeing is, 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 is a very similar thickness to what we're talking about, which is a, a little fact that, that I thought I'd throw in there. Yeah. When you talk millionth of inches, um, I'm sure there's a good joke that I'm probably too dirty to tell. <laughs> well, on that note, we will uh, want to say, everyone, thank you so much for, for joining us, uh, both on Facebook, on YouTube. We want to say thank you to Steve and to Bryce for uh, joining us tonight and telling us a little all about Riga and diving into turntables, getting kind of into the weeds and also sort of demystifying some of the maybe the, the more common things that people may not know about. Uh, turntables. We have. Uh, we'll, we'll do our best to come back and answer as many of these questions as we can in the comments over the next couple of days. There's lots of good questions that we didn't get to have the chance to answer, but we'll we'll go back and try to answer as many of those as we can. And as Leon mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to go to audioadvice.com and you know, call, chat with one of our experts. We have folks on online uh, all, all day, even on Saturdays. So feel free to reach out to us directly. We'd love to have a conversation to help you with that next purchase if you're looking for a turntable. And again, you know, two-day free shipping here anywhere in the U.S., uh, hassle-free returns. Uh, we're here to take care of you. And uh, thank you for, for joining in. So here we are. We're going to announce the winner of our Planar 2 turntable, our Peachtree M24s, uh, and the turntable care package, as well as a nice little Riga swag bag. So the winner is Bob Edge from California. We'll go to the city. So Bob Edge from California is our winner. Congratulations. That's going to be a, a great setup. Thank you for, uh, for joining. Thanks to everyone who joined uh, this month's giveaway. And we are going to announce our next month's giveaway for November, which we are really excited about. It will be live. We're going to go ahead and link to it now. And there'll be uh, a lot of different ways that you can enter. So we're going to be giving away a Klipsch uh, home theater package, a 5.4 Dolby's package that is just going to be killer. It's over a $4,000 value. So thanks to our friends at Clips, we we're going to provide that for next month. Again, it's live now. You can go ahead and join and we will be giving that away. I think it's in early December is when we will announce the, the winner of that. So thank you for everyone again who joined us. Thanks again, um, Bryce and Steve. Really appreciate it. Glad we were able to work out those technical difficulties. Everyone stay with us. And Steve, we appreciate you figuring that out. So you were able to have you on. You were a huge, huge benefit. And uh, thanks again to everyone. Have a great November. Stay safe and uh, stay sane during this time. Hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving. 
And we will see you all again soon next month. Thank you, guys.